We're here in Bamako, Mali, for this edition of the Observers Direct. Our observers are trying to make their city a better place with initiatives online and off to enact change. Let's go and meet them. Bamako, two million residents living on either side of the Niger River. One of the fastest growing cities in the world. It's key to where Mali is going as a country and as a society. Our observers are working for change in the role of women in Malian society, in food hygiene and education for the blind. Omar Sissoko, 21, a history and archaeology student. Yusuf Diakite, 45, an expert in technology for the visually impaired and Bala Mariko, 42, a human rights activist. Bala spends much of his time monitoring social networks. In January 2018, he received a disturbing video via WhatsApp. First off, I thought it was a porn video. The kind of thing people send around sometimes. But then I heard angry words. The video shows a gang rape by a group of young men. It showed a teenage girl with five guys. Like they had absolute power over her to let her live or die. It was horrific. With another activist, Jimmy Traoré, Bala launched an appeal on Facebook to raise one million CFA francs to give to anyone who could help find the victim or the rapists. 48 hours later, a woman came forward. She went to Interpol and told them she knew the victim's mother. Four men were arrested. One of them had wanted to take revenge on the young woman for resisting his advances. Without Bala's initiative, the victim may never have pressed charges. In Mali, violence against women remains a taboo subject, even though more than half the women in the country say they've suffered beatings at the hands of their husbands. We attend a meeting where the aim is to speak out. I'm not blaming my husband, but rather his parents. His father always hit and insulted his mother. So he didn't know how else to communicate with me other than to beat me. And then I found out that I was pregnant, something he refused to accept. I was at risk of miscarrying and he beat me again. So I left because I didn't want him to kill me or my children. Women are responsible for these situations too. We all have violent brothers who beat their wives, and we do nothing about it. This is the kind of story the events organizer, activist Kadida Fofana wants people to talk about. Why don't women dare to talk about the violence they've suffered? There are several factors, but most important is the pressure imposed by society. Because when a woman is killed in our society by her husband, we try to justify the murder, saying that the woman had perhaps been unfaithful, and that's why the husband did what he did. If your husband beats you, your family will say, you can't press charges against your children's father. Other groups in Bamako target men directly. Mariam Diallo invites us to join her at a session she calls School for Husbands, which is run by her association. Someone said the way a woman dresses can lead to rape. Do you think a woman's clothing can cause rape? When men see women in certain clothes, their minds begin to race and sometimes they can't hold back. Some of our young women dress wearing Western clothing. But that isn't a reason for them to be raped. We have to respect their freedom. But because we're not used to this type of clothing, it means that some men get out of hand. Our women used to wear a short wrap and some fabric over their breasts. And there was no rape. Why now? The discussion then turns to a traditional belief that a woman's submission to her husband influences how well their children will do. 
However the man behaves, the woman must accept everything. Whether he is violent or not, she must accept everything her husband decides. That's what she has to do to make sure their children succeed. Is it acceptable for a man to rape or beat his wife? Is that acceptable to you? If the man beats her, it means the woman has not fulfilled her obligations in the home. Some women don't listen to reason. When we talk about submission, we're not asking the woman to be a slave. We're just asking for mutual respect. Members of parliament should know about sessions like this. So they have the information and recommendations they need to get a law passed. Mali is one of the few countries in Western Africa not to have adopted a law targeting gender-based violence. A draft bill exists, but remains blocked because of pressure from religious groups. Omar, we've come to meet you at one of Bamako's markets because a few months ago you sent us videos in which you told us how worried you were about the meat transportation conditions in your city. Yes, that's right. It's really bad. Meat is transported on motorbikes and three-wheelers. It's exposed to the sun, to dust and traffic pollution. The meat gets put out on stalls like that, exposed to flies and dust. That's why I contacted the France 24 observers. While the meat sold generally comes from animals which have just been slaughtered, Omar says he's worried for his health. Why do you transport meat like that on motorbikes? We can't afford refrigerated transportation. At the slaughterhouse, we buy a kilo of meat for 1,900 CFA francs, and we can't sell it on for more than 2,000 CFA francs. None of Bamako's slaughterhouses, private or public, uses refrigerated transportation for meat. Omar invites us to his home to see how the beef is cooked. On the way, we talk to a butcher. He says many of his colleagues aren't even aware of the risks. We don't have enough money to properly train our butchers. And there are organizational problems with the government's supervision too. There are regulations in Mali for the handling and transportation of meat, but the rules aren't properly applied. So butchers end up doing what they like. Is it the government's fault for not enforcing the rules? Yes, the state should do more. Consumer protection groups regularly alert the authorities about the dangers. But in homes like Omar's, people wash the meat as best they can. Our cook's doing the first cleaning of the meat. It removes the fat, covering the meat, which is often covered in dust. Then there's a second cleaning phase. That's vinegar, used to disinfect the meat. The meat is cooked for one or two hours, not enough to guarantee that all the bacteria will be killed. With no scientific studies on the subject, it's impossible to know how many people in Bamako get sick from bad meat. We're meeting the France 24 team today. We've signed an agreement with a foster family next to the school just 150 meters away. It's a family who take in visually impaired children, and these youngsters play with the family's sighted children. In October 2017, Yusuf Diakite, who was born blind, set up this small school, the first in West Africa, where visually impaired and sighted children study alongside one another. There are 26 children in the school's first and second grade class, aged from 5 to 16. Before coming here, none of them had attended school. Yusuf himself convinced each family to enroll them in this unique program. 
Classes are taught by a visually impaired teacher and a sighted assistant. This visually impaired student is riding bicycle on her tablet using the Braille system. She uses a stylus to make dots. A sighted student is writing the same word on the blackboard with a piece of chalk. Why is it crucial for these children to know how to read Braille? Because that's how they learn in school. If a visually impaired pupil can't read Braille, he can't continue with his education. In second year, the students start basic arithmetic. Right. 36 plus 23. 36 plus 23. While sighted pupils write on a slate, the visually impaired children use small arithmetic cubes on which the dots correspond to numbers. 36 plus 23 plus... Six plus three. A few moments later. Equals 59. Excellent. Very good. 1.2% of Mali's population is visually impaired, which is a very high level. The reasons include untreated cases of measles, a lack of vitamin A, and the use of traditional medicines. Parents of blind children often send them out into the streets to beg. That's why Yusuf opened the school. I was lucky enough to go to school myself, hence the idea to start this school. I looked for partners and I didn't find any, so I set it up alone. That's why I went to the bank to take out a 5 million franc loan. I used it to build the little project you can see here. Yusuf has trouble keeping the school afloat and is hoping to find investors to ensure its survival. In the meantime, every Friday he takes three of the blind kids back to his own house for the weekend because their families have abandoned them. The fact that you have to take these children in yourself, is that because the government isn't doing enough for them? No, the authorities are doing what they can, but they are overwhelmed. Everyone should contribute to help these children have an education. It helps lighten the state's load. <laughs> That's the end of this edition of the Observers Direct. Many thanks to our three observers in Bamako for showing us what matters to them in their city. Maybe the next Nin Direct will come from your home city. Feel free to send your images to the Observers Newsroom. All of our Facebook, WhatsApp and email contacts are on the screen. See you soon.